It is the fastest growing podcast in the history of America, or at least this side of Barstow. What's that city up near Nevada? Barstow? Barstow. Barstow. Yeah. I drove through there one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, executive producer Mike McKinnon III, uh, along with Mark Mathis, and the very talented, the humble, and the very kind. As the executive producer, you should make sure that this is on. <laughs> Matthew Pritchard. Yes. Who uh, is originally, or uh, has the newest, I guess you would be the newest edition. Or so. Yeah. Are really you enjoying it here? Yeah. Yeah. It's been about eight months now. It's just it's crazy how long time flies. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm loving it. It's not like San Diego. <laughs> so Matthew uh, is uh, the uh, newest edition of KUSI uh, News, uh, uh, working in the evenings mm-hmm. um, alongside uh, your brother, Logan Burns. That's right. Distant yeah. relative. Yes. Uh-huh. When you guys anchor together, it does look like two twins. You know, one's a little older, one's a little older. We actually call each other, and it's true, before we anchor together, like, who's going to wear what? <laughs> we cannot wear two red ties because it would just be too confusing. So one has to go blue, one has to go red. <laughs> <laughs> How are you liking it here thus far? It's great. I mean, I think if you know, maybe you know, maybe you don't. But I grew up in Orange County, California, so this was a homecoming after 10 years on the road. And so just being back in Southern California and having access to friends, family, the ocean. Yeah. And then just getting to tell stories here and be on TV in Southern California is a dream come true. All right, so you grew up in Orange County. Yeah. Uh, what part of Orange County? Laguna Niguel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I know. That's why I don't like telling people because they, they, they get that look on their face. Now you're talking. I know, yeah, it's a nice area for sure. Oh, you yeah. think? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a good, good area. Um, I was <laughs> telling you, though, like my friends, they lived in these sprawling mansions. I was supposed to you know, we had a nice house, certainly, but it wasn't It wasn't the mansion at the top of the hill. Well, you know, my next door neighbors, uh, his parents live in the Luna Nagel, but they've lived there for, you know, 40 years, and they have a nice home. Don't, I mean, it's probably, they've probably been paid off in a couple 20 years, and they have a nice home. It's not, but it's not, you know, what you think of as far as the, you know, mansions on the hill and all right. that kind of stuff. But boy, Laguna Miguel is very nice. What high school did you? Uh, Elisa Miguel. Okay. Is just over the border in Elisa Viejo. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, it's all good stuff in there. Yeah, I love it out there. Yeah. I wanted to move to Newport Beach for the longest time. My whole family is basically from Newport. Yeah, my dad's side. They all lived in Newport and Newport. Beach lifeguards, water polo players, and swimmers. Did they work for the Irvine Company? No, they didn't. I, well, maybe one of them did. One of the siblings. He didn't. Yeah. And he was like the only sibling that moved away from Newport. Every, the other three still live there. They've stayed there their whole lives. And not that Laguna Niguel is that far away. But, you right. know, at least he moved outside the zip code. Where, uh, no, where did you? Um, where did you get your degree? And, mm-hmm. and uh, what did your folks do? So my dad's in PR, um, and so. You know, he's a writer uh, and sort of a, I, he did a lot of like print journalism in college, but never wanted to deal with the crazy lifestyle that journalism brings. And so I went into the PR side and just got to live his life in Southern California. Uh, mom was a stay at home mom. I think she studied social work in college, but then once uh, she got married and had me, she was nice enough to stay home and make sure everything stayed uh, between the lines, you know, as I was growing up. And then I went to Chapman University in Orange, California. Um, after two years of community college, then we transferred over, did the last two at Chapman. And then uh, on our way across the country to Georgia, to Colorado Springs, to Washington, D.C., and finally back here. You went to Chapman University? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where's that again? So it's in, it's in Orange. It's right across from Anaheim. Oh, okay. Maybe a mile from Angel State. Oh, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. All right, so tell me, so then you branch out on this illustrious broadcasting career, and where was your first gig right after you left college? So it's a fun story because, again, like, take all of my life story in your head of growing up in the Green Miguel, right, Southern California, one of the best places on earth. Sure. I get a job offer to go to a little town in Georgia, three hours south of Atlanta, towards the Florida border called it's named Albany, Georgia. Oh, sure. Um, it's marked at 150. Um, I walked across the stage with a job in hand as well as a degree. Did you really? The next morning, my dad and I hopped in the car. We drove three straight days across the country, and I was working in Georgia that Tuesday. Yeah. Um, starting off my broadcast career in the middle of nowhere. Culture shock of a lifetime. Uh, taught me a lot about how blessed I was in terms of where sure. I had to grow up. 
Um, How long were you there? A year and a half. And, wow. But it was fast, though. I mean, you know, those smaller markets, there's an opportunity to move up quickly. I started out in general assignment, quickly moved up to the weekend anchor desk. They only had a female lead anchor, so they moved me up to the main desk pretty quick. And yeah. So got to really get my What year was that? It was 2012 into 2013. Oh, wow. So that was just uh, recently. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's, it's going to be 10 years next month. Uh, wow. In full. So it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. running around and seeing everything. I don't know. I loved it. I loved it. So, um, so okay. So Albany, Georgia. So then you can go. You can get up to Atlanta if you'd like, and go see. You know, um, you can get the, you get the big city feel if you needed to up yeah. there. And then you go where? Go to Colorado Springs. After okay. that, got okay. a job there. Um, actually, the best decision of my life because spent ended up spending five years there. Met really in Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. Springs. Wow. Met my wife there. Got married there. Um, I already had family. Is she a Colorado gal? She's, yes, is the short answer. But she's from Minnesota, spent some time in Texas, but her family settled in Colorado when she was in middle school. And she's, she's not in the business, right? Thank God, no. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have some stability in my life. <laughs> Someone who's just got the nine to five Monday through Friday. Mm. So, now what does she do? She's in IT. She does uh, sort of just some work with the computer. She's the brains of the operation, what I always tell people. Sure. Yeah. When I met her, she was a genius at the Apple store. Uh-huh. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, so, like, so, was literally genius. And then she sort of shifted into corporate IT after that. And it's pretty, I mean, like I said, she does a real job. I, I just, I'm good at talking to people and giving people to tell them stories. You know? All right. So then you go, and then where do you go? From Colorado Springs. That was the crazy, I always tell like younger journalism students, this is like the story that I want them to resonate with, which is I was in Market 89, which is Colorado Springs. I've been there for five years and I collected some, some really good stuff, done a lot of different things, news, sports, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then I'm sending out tapes and applying for my next gig. And I see this political correspondent position open up in Washington, D.C. for Hearst Television, reporting on national politics for 30 stations across the country. Right. And I go, I'm not qualified for this. I don't have the resume or the experience to possibly get that job. But I'm going to send out a tape anyway, because I, who knows? Maybe right. they'll like what, what I have to offer. Got a call. They flew me out. They liked what they saw. They hired me. And that's why I always tell college kids, I'm like, you just don't know. Right. So right. always send a tape everywhere. And especially these days, because yeah. I think a lot of folks, like even when I was in El Paso, there were a lot of uh, folks that had never worked anywhere else, and they'd send a tape to Houston or Dallas mm-hmm. or whatever to get hired. Right. You know, because these days it's it's a different it's a different animal than it was. You know, when I started, you know, a little bit before you, I started in uh, 1990. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, that would have been what 22 years right. uh, prior to you. So, um, but yeah, it was a little bit different. I mean, you kind of had to. Go from the, you know, from the Albany to the Colorado Springs, and then I got to Dallas in like four years. Wow. But um, anyway, yeah. enough about that. Uh, so oh, Charlotte too, right? I was in Charlotte. Yeah, I worked in. Uh, I started in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which I love because it was like you know I just graduated from Baylor, and so I was going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and then I went to uh, Myrtle Beach, and then I worked in Charlotte on the weekends, and then I went to Charleston, and then I went to Dallas, and then I came out. Let's see. Oh, then I went to Austin here, back to San Antonio. And then I had a couple of stints at the Fox affiliate in Charlotte. The cool. first time I worked in Charlotte was at NBC. Huh. And then I worked twice in San Antonio, Sacramento, twice in San Diego. So, bounced around. Do you have a favorite out of all of them? I loved Charleston at the time. It was a beach community. It was a fun town. But it was the kind of time in my life that I'm hanging out with a bunch of 27, 28, 29 years. Yeah. We just... None of us were married. It was kind of like yes. an episode of Friends, you know. Mm-hmm. And I like Tuscaloosa, you know, but I think Austin was a great time. I had to work in a bad city, yeah. you know. Even the smaller markets have been really fun. There is something about like, the smaller markets especially because I think the newsroom reads that sort of camaraderie. Yeah. You know, and, like you're all, it's, yeah, it's, it's you like against the world. It's you know? a graduate school. Yeah, right? it is. That's what it is, you know, because all of you are young. Maybe a few older people in the, you know, yeah. but for the most part, everybody's young. But even the older folks have, are young at heart because they're in this newsroom full of a bunch of young people. Right, right. So, right. Keeps them young too. Yeah. so then you went to Hearst and uh, and you worked out there for like three years. Yeah, three years. That's something I always wish I would have done. I wish I would have been like a, a 
you know, covered the White House, or covered government, just to kind of get a better handle on the inner workings of it. Yeah. You know, so what did you learn out there? Everything and anything. In fact, when I was leaving, what I was... What a great gig. Yeah. I mean, it, it was. I mean, I always say to people, it's the education of a lifetime. Sure. Every American should be forced to go spend three years where your life is watching Senate hearings and House sure. hearings and understanding how the government functions and does what it does. Right. I think I, I think I left with sort of a a healthy appreciation for the flaws in both political parties. You know, I think it, it sort of tore the veil for me a little bit on politics. Right. And I just sort of like, I left just feeling like, you know, there's some good politicians out there on both sides. I mean, there they're, they're sure. really are, that really are there to try and do good work. Um, but then there are some there that are there as career politicians, right? And they just want to keep themselves in office and moving forward day after day. And so it just sort of, you know, to an extent, some of them, it felt like they were putting on a show, you know? And so it was frustrating in that way, but it was motivating as a journalist to feel like you should challenge them, you know, and, and try and tell a fair and balanced story and inform people on a nightly basis of what their, their government and their politicians are doing. So, I mean, like I said, it was every single day it was like drinking out of a fire hose, but, sure. but it was so fulfilling and, and you felt like you were making a difference. I mean, the weird thing about what I had to do was my stories had to air in Birmingham and Boston on the same night and, and, not, and not piss anybody off. You know? well, did you have to retract the whole story no. from Birmingham no. and retract it from Boston? It, it, literally, it literally was a dance of like, you had to make sure that you had the exact same amount of Democrats and Republicans in the story, that you had the exact same amount of time that you had given each of them. You know, I worked for two different presidential administrations, the Trump administration, and then a bit of, a bit of the start of the Biden administration. So you want to make sure you're representing what the administration is saying and showing what the Congress is saying and then what the pundits are saying. And you just try and hit it on every single front so that when people watch your story, they kind of walk away feeling indifferent. Right. right. They walk away, they feel like, well, I agree with this. I didn't agree with that, but I got the information. Thanks very much. Goodbye. You know, right. and that's right. literally all I wanted to accomplish. Right. You know? Right. Well, you know, there's so many people that look at Fox News or even look at CNN or MSNBC or any of these things, and they'll see these opinion shows and they think that they're news shows, but they're not. They're opinion right. shows. Right. And uh, I mean, I think for the most part, Fox News is, is pretty straight down the middle on their news programs early in the morning, you know, the right. one that Shepard Smith used to, to host. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, I just have a I have a hard time watching some of the other ones. Um, MSNBC is so far left, they're almost right. Um, but in CNN, you know, I don't know. But I'm sure you rubbed uh, elbows with all those, that crew. And yeah. do, do, do most of those uh, political reporters kind of feel the same way? Uh, or are they, or did you sense that they were trying to push an agenda? I think it's interesting. I think. Um... I didn't sense an agenda being pushed. I think you could tell the question that they were shopping around. Right. I guess, or what they were trying to, you know, kind of go a certain person into or, you know, an angle that they wanted to take. I don't know if I would go full blown agenda with that, but I think you saw the shift. It was interesting for me, at least, to see the shift between administrations and right. see how the questions changed. Right. right. I mean, like you would watch sure. about like Fox News when it was. For instance, when it was the Trump administration, uh -huh. I mean, the questions weren't quite as fierce, right? I right. mean, like, it, it, they weren't going after him as hard. But then, when it's turned over to the Biden administration, now they're asking harder questions. And the vice versa can be said for the other networks as well. Right. You know, it's like, there's a shift that took place. And you could feel the shift take place. But at the same time, what I, I always tell people is, it, it very much in Washington felt like an ecosystem. Right. I mean, it's like everyone's kind of operating around the same nucleus and we're all just kind of running in the same direction. I, it's just it's, it's like you're working in a building together, right. which are in different departments, but everyone's kind of in the same lane. Yeah, I've and heard that so many times from people that have worked in Washington. Some of my friends are all like, uh, Mike Emanuel is one of them. He and I worked in Austin together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he works at Fox News now, but he was saying it just feels like you just, you've got to get out of the bubble of Washington to even really realize what is important to people because you're sucking this bubble in Washington. 
And you're kind of you're kind of being led by what they're telling you is important. And unless you get out of Washington and start really listening, you know, to some people, that it's hard to really, really understand what's important to to Americans because it's something to bubble that they don't. I think there's some truth to that. I, for me, at least as a journalist, the thing that I was, I was tired of interviewing politicians and, and pundits and talking heads because there's no realism to right. that. Um, I like talking to real people and hearing real stories. It's one of the reasons like over here, like the opportunity over the last month and a half to be interviewing Ukrainian refugees that are arriving at our southern border and hear their real life stories, you know, real pain that they have gone through. That's so much more fulfilling than talking to a politician or talking to a talking head. Right. Day after day after day. I can get that. So what? So what? What? What's pushed your hot button here at KUSI as far as what you've covered and, and that kind of thing? What is like really? You know, because I mean, when people say, "I'll pick it up," I'm just you know, sorry, <laughs> producer M3 over here. <laughs> Seriously, I wish I got it. I think I'm gonna get a haircut. Get a haircut. Yeah. Or hair yeah. Um, so, so what I said, reporters are just like, you know, they say, oh, well, I just, I just want to cover the story, but there's got to be something that has pushed your hot button a little bit, uh, that you know, that that kind of drove you to to maybe dig a little bit more, or ask more questions, or interest you probably a little bit more. Has there been anything over the last eight months that you're like, damn, I gotta, I gotta find some more information? On that, or does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Sense. It does. I'm trying to process it in my head. I mean, I, I feel like um, I, I do feel like when it, I'm going back to Ukraine because it, that's been recent and it's fresh in my mind. But when all of this started to kind of happen, it was like I don't, you know, we know it's happening. We know they're going to be arriving, but when and how and where and who's going to help? That's when I started to try and kind of look into all the community groups, the attorneys, the churches, the charities that might be trying to, you know, get involved and, and help out these people that are coming from a far off land and just trying to seek safety here in the United States. And it sort of tugged at my heart a little bit and wanted, I wanted to find that story. And so I feel like we've been able to do that. I mean, we've been able to talk with so many community groups just here in our general area, whether it be a rally at Balboa Park or the actual thing that's happening down uh, at the border, I think we've been able to really give people and paint a picture of what's taking place in our community and kind of bring it home. I mean, I think that's the point of local news is to show people what's happening in their community. Take a big story that's happening 6,000 miles away and bring it down to what's happening 30 miles away. Right. You know, and so now I don't know, there's a lot of benefit to that. And I've, I've been really proud of the coverage that I've done on that. All right. So, and then, you know, I think you're in a, such a cool situation. And, you know, people look at KUSI and they don't realize, for instance, and I'll just give you that when Casey and I went out the other day and it was like, it was Deep Dish Pizza Day or something like this. We got this Deep Dish Pizza place. And, uh, and we're just yucking up. I'm there for a couple of hair hits and we're just keeping around. Yeah. Eating deep dish pizza. So later that day, I was walking my dog, and I went by the pizza place, which because it's right by my house, and I just popped my head in there, and I said, hey, listen, I just want to say thanks for getting up early and, you know, coming on the show, because I really appreciate it. He, and this was a Tuesday, and he said, dude, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, but I've had people from all over this county come to this pizza place, Ramona, Valley Center, Powell. Followed down to Mission Valley to get deep dish pizza because they saw us in KUSI. Yeah. There is such a loyalty to this television station um, that, and it's not like anything I've ever really seen or experienced before. And I've worked with every television station there is, um, from the real serious, you know, WFAAs of the world that think they're curing cancer by their television coverage to, you know, the goofy Good Morning Sacramento type shows that are like, hey, it's just. You know, going to run around with under the one on their head for a minute. But the reach that this television station has is 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 unbelievable. And I think you guys, the reporters at night, have such an opportunity to really cover this city, unlike anything that that KUSI does, because you've got a little time to go and dig and find the stories that that are important to. Have you found that to be true, or have you experienced that yet here at KUSI? I've definitely experienced the how ingrained we are in the community. I mean, you know, if you're out in the shop 
one of two things gets yelled at you from a passing car, and thankfully it's not profanity, like it can't be in other markets. Yeah. It's either a USI gets yelled at you or a, it ain't right. And you get those things yelled at you, and you're like, man, I mean, that's legacy stuff. And those oh, yeah. guys that haven't worked, I'm not, I'm not actually sure, but I know they haven't worked here for, for a good bit of time. You know? Sure. But, but they're a lasting impact on the community, and people remember it. Right. It says a lot about the station and how people feel about it. Right. So, uh, are you enjoying uh, your time here? I mean, are you? In, I mean, uh, what what kind of future aspirations? Then I'm going to get back to some of the stuff that you'd like to cover and some of the things you have covered. But what kind of future aspirations do you have? I mean, would you like to be on network news one day? You want to stay in SoCal? And, you know, stay here. Or, it's a good. Uh, it's a, it's a fair question for sure. I mean, I. I, I've always said through my career, I, I sort of go with the wind, you know, where it sort of takes me. Um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have really good opportunities come along along the way, but it's been 10 years away from Southern California and away from my friends and family. And so I'm kind of just enjoying the moment right, right now, you yeah. know, just being happy to be able to spend holidays and birthdays and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I like working at KUSI. I like being here in San Diego. My wife really likes San Diego, which is the biggest thing. She's happy here. Happy wife. Happy wife. Exactly. So I mean, you know, we're you know we're moving into other phases of life too, and so it just I don't know. You know, it's uh, I'm I'm content. I guess where I am at the moment. Yeah, I was uh, a friend of mine used to be the weather guy uh, on Good Morning America uh, by the name of Sam Champion. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he and I were just talking one day and, and he said, you know, I never really had a, uh, a goal for my career. I just kind of went where, and I said, you know, I had one goal and that was to make it to WFAA. And after I got there, I was miserable. Yeah. And, uh, so I just kind of take it where the gigs are, you know, and, um, there are certain things I've wanted to do, you know, that kind of thing. I've wanted to be on a goofy morning show and, you know, yeah. and, I did all that, and so it was fun, but I, I have found that whenever you go where the opportunities are, when they present themselves, and you do the best job that you can, then that's usually been the best experiences of my life, and also don't ever go home until you have more to offer them than they have to offer you, Yeah, you know, because yeah. if you don't, like like I went to WFA, which you were, you know, I, I should have gone, I should have waited a few more years, so I've been a little bit more mature. You know, and sure. I was probably talent wise, that's fine, but just being able to navigate through a big newsroom mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, you know. No, so no, I mean, all right, so let's get back to let's get back to you, Matthew. Please, please, <laughs> I'm an expert on this. <laughs> so, you have what, what has pissed you off here in San Diego County where you're saying, you know what, I'm gonna go cover that, I'm gonna go try to figure out. Why they're doing this, why they're doing that. Has there been any political thing that has happened? Has there been any uh, city government thing that has happened? Has there been anything that has just happened where you're like, you know what? That is not right. That ain't right. That ain't right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a, it's and a, I know these are questions that you really kind of have to process in the well, and when yeah, you get down, you're going to think of about shit again. Well, that's the thing. So we're trying to think back on eight months of gay terms where we've covered a lot of really important stuff, right? you know, along the way. Um, I'm just trying to think of something that's really stood out. I mean, I think, you know, we've gotten the chance to do some, some breaking news, which, which I, I think, again, I, I think it's important to inform people about what's happening in the community. In terms of politics, I don't know if I've covered that big political story yet that has really like been like, I need to track down something here and and question authority and that sort of thing. I don't think that's happened for me yet. Right. But, you know, I'm, I've always said, this is a good way to answer this question. I've never taken an, an investigative reporter job because you have to have a certain something in you to want to do that. I mean, right. you have to want to go and chase down and question and push all the buttons, you know, and I'm like, and that's great. And those guys are fantastic at what they do. Sure. I really enjoy informing people about what's happening today in their community. I really love breaking news. It's one of my favorite things to cover. Right. And I like to cover heart, heartwarming stories that have a little bit of an edge. Again, going back to Ukraine, heartwarming, but let's be real, you know, about what's happening in the situation. Right. Where I do think that, you know, maybe that story evolves into community groups have come so far and they've done so much, but where is the government, all of, you know, 
helping me. We've seen him talk about bringing in 100,000 refugees. They've pulled off Title 42. They've made humanitarian parole an option to get in. This is all on the federal level. Now they're coming. What are we doing? Right. Uh, and so I think that's probably the next obvious question in, in the process is why are we leaving this to community members and churches and things like that when government is meant to be there to, to help them? How about, how about these illegal, illegal immigration that is happening? And you can turn that on now if you'd like to see. Yeah, just why why is turned into that one. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, but have you, have you dealt much with the um, either the Haitians, Hispanics, or that type of thing coming across the border? Uh, have you dealt much with that? The only thing that I've talked about is the question that kept coming up of why can the Ukrainians get across when the Haitians and the Guatemalans and, you know, all these different and why you, And what is the answer to still that? Waiting. And the answer that I've received from my reporting is that it's a different situation in terms of what they're fleeing. The Ukrainians are fleeing political persecution on the part of Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Right. They've been chased away because of a politician's president's, you know, ambitions to take over their country. And sure. so based off our international treaties, based off uh, our agreements with our allies and our own immigration laws, they have they are seeking something else. It's different. It's a different situation than what these other groups are pleading. Now, again, this is just what, what my reporting has shown by talking to immigration attorneys uh, and, and different people that are much smarter than me and know, know this stuff. Those people many times are fleeing real dangers in sure. their countries. It could be gang violence, it could be cartels, it could be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not a political persecution. And it, and it doesn't fall in the same categories as... Uh, the different treaties that we've signed and what our allies expect of us. Mm -hmm. um, the Ukrainians are coming across with humanitarian parole. That's basically a way of going case by case for customs and border protection, but they can make a call on each individual person because we know what they're fleeing from. They get to pass through in that way. So it's very interesting, right? I mean, because that question is obvious mm -hmm. and it's very glaring. But I, I think people oftentimes try and seek out controversy where sometimes there really isn't one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this is pretty cut and dry in a way um, in terms of what the law says. Now, whether or not the law is right, that's a whole different question well, for another day. <laughs> sure. But the way everything stands right now, that's what I've been told is that these people can come in because of what they're facing as opposed to these other groups. Now, I'm thinking back to 2012 when you got into the business, and I can't. Social media, did it, where, gosh. Facebook really kind of got going, what, in 2008, something like that? At the time, you had to be in college to have a yeah. So, I mean, it was just starting to develop. I don't think Instagram was even on the, on the radar. It was new. I mean, yeah. not new, but it was, it was low key at that point. How do you see. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues with your gig is there's so much information out there. Mm -hmm. Most of it not true, or they're taking just a little bit of a blip and posting it as fact, you know, and you really kind of have to get underneath those little headlines that people post on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and see what the truth of that issue is. Mm -hmm. Have you found it harder to be a, uh, you know, daily reporter? Um, day stores that kind of thing with when you have when you're battling against the social media world, you know. Yeah, I mean, is that is that a fair question or no? I think so. I mean, it, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate, I guess, in a way that I just, it's been around my whole career. Um, you know, I just try to try to present, you know, everything in, in its factual as much as many facts as I can fit into a hundred and however many characters. You know what I mean? And, and try and lay out as much of the story as I can. But viewers still misconstrue and, and misunderstand or they don't click past the headline. You know, they'll read, they won't read the article or they won't watch the video. That can be frustrating, you know, when all your hard work isn't actually viewed, you know, and people take it only for half or they take out what they want from it. Well, that, that, and I think that's something that KUSI kind of brings to the table that nobody else does is that we have an opportunity. Everybody knows what the news is by the time the news comes on during the evening. What perspective we give those headlines is what I think differentiates us from other people because they already know what's happening. But we have time 
and you know they give the reporters time to kind of go underneath whatever the headlines are mm -hmm. and i think that's what separates us from the other as opposed to just doing the blanket story that's a minute and a half or two minutes I mean, you guys can sometimes have six or seven minutes to, to tell a story and really go underneath is that something that you appreciate or is that something that you would rather not get into um because I, I mean and let's be fair yeah there are there are a lot of reporters that don't that don't want to do it and there's a lot of reporters that do mm -hmm. you know that they want to kind of get their voice out but there's some that just want to do the minute and a half story mm -hmm. because they don't want to they want they don't want to get into that that very thin line of opinion and yeah. that kind of thing or even voicing their stories to slant a certain way is that something that you like or don't like or you just I, I think, I mean, like my style and, and my opinion of it is people's attention spans are very short these days. And so if you're doing a four or five, six minute piece, it has to be so engaging. I mean, it has to, it, it has to grip you. I mean, sure. I mean, it has to, because they're, they're going to tune it out. Whether they realize they're doing it or not, they're going to realize that they're going to tune out at the two minute mark. Mm -hmm. And so I try to fit within two minutes. That's usually where I try to live. But granted, I came from my last shop where it was a minute 20, and you hit a minute 20, no matter what. Right. And you better hit everything, everything in a minute 20. So I learned a lot about how to pack tracks with as much info as possible, sure. pick the right sound bites. What I like about here, I don't have to just fit it into a minute 20. Right. I can expand it out to two minutes, right. which for me, 40 seconds is a ton. I can do a lot. In 40 seconds. So I guess it really depends on what's your style of writing, what's your style of storytelling. I mean, how much can you accomplish in two minutes? Can you read through and recognize that you're repeating yourself, you know, or can you and then pull it out and then condense and get it into a bite sized portion for someone to really register? Because I also think you can get too in the weeds on a story for people. Like, you know, most, a lot of people, they don't have time. They, they just don't. They, they've got their kids, they got their job, they got. Everything. And when they get home at the, at the end of the day and they're watching the news, tell me what matters. Give me the bite-sized portion. You're the reporter. You've spent the entire day on this. So you know what, what I need to know. So tell me what I need to know. And to keep opinion out of it. Right. Those, those are the two goals every single night. For me. Yeah. They, uh, the opinion part of it is, um, you know, it, 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 well, it's just... I don't care what network you watch, or there, there seems to be more and more, and the lines are becoming so blurred between true journalism and, you know, what, and, and I think it's because of networks that started in the late 90s and that kind of thing, because they, were, they really did offer a slant one way or another. So then the other networks said, well, if you're going to slant that way, we're going to slant this way. And now people coming up only see those two things, you know, and but um, so I, I think you answered that question fairly, you know. I just um, think I think everyone has a style, right? You know what I mean? Like I'm not I, trying to get you to say something no, that you that you no, don't no, say. No, and I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate the question. What right. I think KUSI does well is it allows reporters to be themselves, right? And, and do the work the way they feel it should be done. I mean, you know, if, if you're watching Good Evening San Diego. And you watch David Plant's piece, and then you watch my piece. There's a difference. There. There's a difference in how both of us tackle a story. Sure. And I think both both perspectives, both ways of going about it, the viewers, you know, will make their own determination of what they like and what they don't like. Right. You know, and KUSI allows that sort of breathing room, I guess, for for reporters to do the story the way they think it should. Did be you know Dan's dad while you were in Washington? I didn't, but. Uh, it's a legend now. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't know if you guys kind of crossed paths. I don't know because he's. I mean, he's been around. For, well, he was the White House correspondent for CBS for yeah a hundred years. Mm -hmm. His brother has a national talk show there in, in Arizona. Is that it? I think oh, it's in DC. Oh, it is out of DC. Chris Plant. Oh, huh? Chris, Chris Plant. Yeah. Yeah, I know. He says he goes back. I think his dad lives in Georgetown too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, his dad was, I remember watching him when I was at FAA. Yeah. You know, he was the, the White House. I mean, like the White House.
was correspondent. I know there were a lot of them, but yeah, if you yeah. really wanted to know what was going on, you would. That's the crazy thing in the White House. It's like, you know, people are, I mean, there's the ones you know, but then there's a hundred others, you know, that are just right. cramming in to the press room. It's just so tiny, you know, and everyone's just cramming it's in. It's a little bit. a little bit or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I mean, long story short, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a, there's a door to a room where the pool, I think, was um, where all reporters signed their names to people who covered it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, it floods the press room. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's like the basement, basically. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so, that, that, I, I went there a few times. I had a friend that worked in the White House, and so I went there. Uh, several times. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on, and uh, maybe if uh, in the future when we have some hot stories or stuff, and, and you know, Mikey says, "Hey, you think you could just do?" I'd love for you to come back on, and, and yeah, we need to hang out though. But uh, you have to understand that if we're going to hang out, people are going to say, "Look, Mathis, you're way better than me." That's, That's fair. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I totally understand. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, look at this. Right? I know, and, and we'll bring Logan. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's true. It's fair. Yeah, well, you'd be better looking than most of us. So, you know, <laughs> double up. <laughs> we can ride in this Porsche. Yeah. Great. Well, let's that. say that. No, we bring him along for the Porsche. For the Porsche. There you Just go. For the Porsche. Yeah. So, you know why he does the Porsche. Uh, yeah, D- Dad's uh, grease. <laughs> <laughs> There's other reasons. Yeah.